Hello and welcome to this event by SOAS is Influencing the Corridors of Power Project, also known as ICOP. Our guest speaker is someone who has profoundly impacted my understanding of the world, and I'm sure many of you would say the same thing too. He's, of course, the one and only Professor Noam Chomsky. But before we hear from him, I do need to tell you just a little bit about ICOP. My name's Nina Arif and I'm part of the ICOP team. We're a group of students and academics led by Professor Alison Scott Bowman and backed by SOAS University of London. ICOP connects expert academics with members of parliament and we know some are among the audience today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over now to a remarkable philosopher, linguist, cognitive scientist and political activist among other things. Professor Noam Chomsky, and our host this evening, Joe Glenton. Joe is a best-selling author, journalist, and filmmaker who once served with the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan, which is the topic of today's event. Just to let you know, we've closed the live chat, but we do have our audience questions, which were submitted prior to the event. So Joe, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you, Nina, um, for that introduction. and uh, Thank you for joining us. Professor Chomsky. I'm very conscious that people are here for you, not me, and I'll get, um, I'll get a chance to speak a little bit later on um, about my ideas. But um, um, I just want to, just to frame this discussion, just go back um, about two decades and start with some of, um, some of your analysis at the time when the, when the, the war in Afghanistan was about to begin. Um, and I was going over some of your some of your work from the time and wanted to revisit it and see see how you looked at that work now and if it still reflected your views. Um, I, I, and so to ask, do you still stand by the comments immediately post 9-11? Um, and and you, you spoke in very strong terms. You're an ardent opponent of the of the wars. And you said that you had the USA had no legitimate grounds for going into Afghanistan no matter how bad the Taliban were, I'm paraphrasing there, um, um, obviously. Um, but can you just can you just reflect for us um, on those views now and how they may have shifted or how they may have um, become stronger in the 20 years which have passed? Yes, I, a good deal has been learned since. For example, at the time of those comments, I did not know things that have been revealed later. So for example, turns out that eight months after the invasion of the, that's long after the comments you quoted, the uh, 
head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, gave his first extensive press conference uh, in which he explained to the press that after the most intensive investigation in human history, the FBI suspected that Al Qaeda and bin Laden were involved in 9-11, but they were not able to establish it. Well, that's eight months after the invasion. Didn't know that at the time of the remarks. We now know more. So it now turns out, it's now being revealed that uh, when the Taliban, a couple of weeks after the invasion, the Taliban pretty much retreated to their villages and they offered a full surrender, which of course would have meant handing over bin Laden and Al Qaeda. Uh, the US, US responded by saying, we do not negotiate surrenders. In other words, we're gonna use force and violence. We don't care whether you surrender or not. And we don't care about bin Laden and Al Qaeda. That was actually followed up. That was Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. It was immediately followed up by the president, George Bush reiterated it when he was asked later, a couple of months later, what do you know about the whereabouts of bin Laden? He said, we don't really care. We're not paying much attention to him. Uh, we have other things in mind. Uh, the other things that they had in mind later came out. Uh, we've known it now for about 17 or 18 years. Uh, the plans were, of course, to attack Iraq as soon as they had a chance. That was the real concern. But then to move on to uh, a, a hope throughout the region, overthrow governments, install pro-US governments. Afghanistan was just a sideshow. Uh, and in fact, the, the best reasons I've seen presented for the invasion were actually published in uh, Britain in The Guardian, an interview with uh, uh, Abdul Haq, the uh, leading, most respected leading resistance, anti-Taliban resistance leader. He uh, had an interview with a well-established Central Asia specialist in which he was asked, uh, why do you think the Americans invaded? He said, they don't care about the Afghan people. They know they're going to kill a lot of Afghans, but they just, and they will undermine our efforts to overthrow the Taliban from within, which he thought were fairly promising, but they don't care. They just want to show their muscle and intimidate everyone. In other words, we don't negotiate surrenders. We just want to show our muscle, intimidate everyone, go on to carry out a broader uh, uh, interventions in the region. That was the goal. Was there any legitimacy? And I should say this invasion was undertaken on the assumption that they might be starving millions of people to death a few days after the, uh, uh, when the invasion was announced before it had taken place, uh, the US cut off all food supplies from Pakistan to Afghanistan. Uh, this was with the understanding that millions of people, millions, UN estimated maybe up to 7 million people would be facing starvation. Uh, the bombing uh, disrupted the, was right at the time which disrupted the uh, planting. The uh, provides about 80% of uh, grain supplies. UN agencies predicted that would put millions of people at risk. But uh, none of this was of any concern, just as Al Qaeda was of no concern. It was just as Al Haq, as uh, Al Haq pointed out, show our muscle, intimidate everyone. We don't negotiate surrenders, move on to the next much important, more important tasks of invading Iraq and extending our power in the region. Well, actually there's by now, well, you were, you were there, you know, can talk from firsthand experience, but there's been extensive reporting uh, by the few reporters and uh, human and 
aid activists who stayed on the ground all the time. People like Anand Gopal wrote extensively about this. He said at the very beginning, when the US invaded, the people were hoping for people in the rural areas, maybe there'll be peace. Maybe they'll be able to do something to help us. Within a couple of weeks, that was gone. The US invaders turned to uh, people who could manage the local affairs for them, who were the warlords, the warlords who'd been ravaging the place were the people that the US Army turned to. So they continued their activities. Uh, it re US reinstalled some of the worst and most brutal of the warlords in the local, who had their own local fiefdoms. And they, as an aunt, as Gopal describes, they realized they could use the American army for their own purposes. They could inform US intelligence, as it's called, that uh, over in some other village somewhere, which happened to be their enemy, uh, there were Taliban supporters. So the UN would move in, special forces would start smashing up people's houses, start bombing, Pretty soon you have more Taliban recruits. Uh, in fact, what happened was pretty well described by the uh, by Roderick Braithwaite. He was the uh, he's a leading Afghan specialist. Uh, he was the uh, British ambassador to Afghanistan during the to Russia, sorry, during the last years of the Russian invasion and their withdrawal the author of the major book on the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. He returned to Afghanistan in 2006. I had an, wrote an interesting article in the Financial Times, it's worth reading. He spoke to a wide range of people, uh, former Mujahideen, uh, government people, women's groups, and others. He said they were nostalgic about the period when the Russians were there. And when the Taliban were in, they said it's much better than now. Uh, and they described uh, Najibullah, the last figure that the Russians had installed uh, as they were leaving, is that he seemed to be the most popular person in Afghanistan. And he ends up saying he doesn't know how much of this is myth, how much is reality, but at least it reflects what Afghans are thinking now after a few years of the invasion. This was in Kabul, not in the rural areas where it was much worse, of course. So I think that's the general picture. If you ask what I think about what I wrote then, wasn't anywhere near strong enough. There was no justification whatsoever for the invasion. If the Americans had been interested in Al Qaeda in Bin Laden, very likely that a small police operation would have sufficed, probably with the cooperation of the Taliban, who didn't want to have Bin Laden around. They couldn't expel him because of the tribal culture, which doesn't permit him, but he was just a nuisance to them. They didn't want the Americans attacking them. So they, we don't know for sure, but they probably would have agreed. And we know that they did offer a couple of months later, total surrender, meaning do what you like, but we don't negotiate surrenders. Sure. Thank you, Professor Chomsky, um, for that answer. I just wanna kind of, cause there are some echoes of um, uh, uh, obviously aid agencies and certain Western governments are refusing to cooperate now. And, there, and there, there's talk of, of famine again in Afghanistan. So there are echoes of that period um, once again, and this is, I suppose this is a, a, new, a nuanced question. When we look at the balance of power, the balance of forces in Afghanistan now, who do we think are the legitimate, and I understand we might want to problematize the term legitimate, but the legitimate, if you like, players um, in Afghanistan, but also around Afghanistan, interested in Afghanistan. And I'm talking particularly, of course, about Russia, about China, and of course, Pakistan, who've been who have been centrally involved, deeply have deeply interlinked with Taliban for the whole of the 
um, occupation. Could you just speak to that, that balance of forces in Afghanistan a little bit? Well, there are two positions crystallizing now about how to deal with the current situation. Uh, one of them is the regional powers, China, Central Asian powers, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Russia, uh, Pakistan, India. That's basically the group that uh, comes out of the China-based Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, they have taken a definite position. Their position is, they've stated it clearly, is the Taliban are the governing authorities, like it or not, no question of legitimacy. They are there, they're running the country. We should deal with them. We should try to get them to moderate their positions, to be more inclusive, to shift their economy from the uh, opium-based economy under the US invasion to uh, using their mineral resources and turning their economy in a different direction. And crucially, we should alleviate the very serious humanitarian crisis. That's the China-based regional position. There was one opponent in the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization discussions, India. India opposed this. India chose to align with the United States which has a different position. The United States position is we must punish the Taliban. We're withholding the Taliban, the government finances, which happen to be in New York banks, withhold them, don't deal with them, uh, pressure the international financial institutions not to give them loans, punish them as much as possible uh, because uh, they're not doing what we want. Those are the two positions that are crystallizing. Uh, Europe is mostly going along with the United States as it usually does. Europe is much too cowardly to act on its own. So when the US uh, say imposes sanctions on Iran, which the European Union opposes strongly, it nevertheless obeys them because you have to obey the master. It's basically the European position. So they're pretty much going along with the United States on this, though I don't think they like the policy. Well, that's the way things are shaping up. Uh, as you can tell from my own comments, I think the regional powers, the China-based regional system is following the correct position. So if, like it or not, the Taliban are running the place. Uh, so the local population, they either accept it or support it, but some mixture of that. Actually, the one surprise, at least to me, in the uh, Taliban victory, sudden Taliban victory, was how multi-ethnic it became. Um, and the fact that the government immediately collapsed and ran away was no surprise. It was just a morass of corruption. The fact that the Afghan army pretty much dissolved was no great surprise either. Uh, for one thing, a lot of it is ghost soldiers just there for corruption. Uh, many of them saw no reason to fight for a foreign power. So they, but what was surprising, I think, maybe not to you, it was surprised to me, was the way the, uh, the warlords of the Tajik and Uzbek uh, sectors quickly capitulated to the Taliban. They had resisted them before strongly. The Taliban had been a Pashtun-based movement. Now it seems to be multi-ethnic, even the Northern Alliance pretty much capitulated. That's new. And uh, what it indicates, whether we like it or not, is that they happen to be the governing authorities. And in that situation, my feeling is we should adopt pretty much the kinds of policies that China and the regional powers are advocating. Deal with them, try to moderate their behavior to the extent possible, try to get them to shift away from the opium-based economy 
for which Europe is largely responsible, I should say, that they're the recipients of the heroin, but uh, move towards a viable economy and crucially deal with the extraordinary humanitarian crisis. Can't just let millions of people starve to death because we don't like their government. So I think that's the policy that Europe, UK should shift to. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Um, I, I'm going to roll um, some questions, uh, two questions into one here. Um, obviously, I, I mean, I, for those of us who, are, who have been involved in Afghanistan, as I have, who have been concerned with Afghanistan over the years, who have observed Afghanistan, there is a temptation, I think, in some quarters to, to look at it as a kind of lost cause. Um, and so part of that question is, is Afghanistan a lost cause? And if it is not a lost cause, uh, whatever we make of that question, um, what, do you see solutions in the future? Do you see hope for the Afghan people coming from somewhere? Well, first of all, we should recognize that there were Afghan peace forces. How substantial they were, it's very hard to say in the circumstances of war and violence, but they were there. Actually, I was in contact with them for years. It was possible to contact with. They, they were scattered through rural Afghanistan. Uh, I think where they are now, I don't know, but I think those forces can be resurrected. When we ask whether Afghanistan is a lost cause, lost for whom? And for the Afghans? Well, we should help them the best we can to reconstruct from the wreckage of 40 years of uh, violence and war. It, from the reports on the ground, it seems that there is this general relief that maybe finally, after all this time, we'll be freed from violence, uh, from soldiers smashing into our house at midnight and arresting uh, my husband and my son and throwing them into torture chambers uh, from uh, drones constantly overhead. We never know when they're going to suddenly uh, uh, get rid of a couple of people talking across the street. If we can get free from that, that's at least the beginning. Then let us reconstruct their society, however we do it. Okay, I don't think it's going to be pretty, not at all. It's going to be ugly from our point of view, but it's for the Afghans to figure out how to determine whether it's a lost cause or a saved cause. And we should be as supportive as we can in their efforts. That means working with the governing authorities, doing what we can to moderate their behavior, but our prime concern for the first time should be the Afghans, the Afghan people. That's never been a concern. You look at the so-called aid flow. I mean, most of it just went to corrupt officials. Uh, sometimes a school was built in a village, but uh, in a way that it would be destroyed by the warlords uh, two months later. Almost nothing went to local people that of any that lasting lasting uh, character. Uh, huge amounts of corruption, robbery. Uh, um, we saw that very clearly when it all quickly collapsed, but it was pretty obvious before. I'm sure it was obvious to you when you were there on the ground. But uh, so for the first time, we should care. And this is the first time in 40 years, I should say, we should care for the Afghans. There was strong support, Western US-based support for the Mujahideen who uh, uh, struggled against the Russian invasion. But the purpose was not to aid Afghans. Purpose was made very clear by the CIA chase station chief in Islamabad. I was asked who was running the show. He said, we're there, he said, to kill Russians. That's our goal. We don't care about the Afghans. What happens to them is not our business. We're there to kill Russians. Okay, that was, you go all the way up to the top. Uh, first of all, Brzezinski, 
under the Carter administration, national security advisor, uh, then under the Reagan administration, same thing. Uh, in fact, towards the end of the Russian invasion, which was pretty horrible, they may have killed about a million people. But in the last couple of years, they had established in Kabul pretty much what the Americans did. It had turned into a pretty liberated city. Uh, women were free to do what they want. They could wear whatever clothes they wanted. They could, the literacy for women shot way up. Uh, women were having jobs all over. They did have problems. The problems were the US backed Mujahideen. The worst of them were the US favorites, the most brutal of them, the Hekmatyar group. These are people who would be throwing acid in the faces of young women college students if they weren't wearing the right clothes. There was a lot of important reporting about that. It could not appear in the US media. This was coming from people like Russell Basu, the UN, uh, the UN uh, rapporteur for women's rights living in Afghanistan, who was writing highly regarded international feminist figure, women who organized the International Year of Women, highly respected figure, was writing articles about the status of women in Kabul in the last years of the Russian invasion, sent them to US journals, refused to publish them, even feminist journals like Ms. Magazine refused to publish them. Uh, you could read them in the Asian press. Uh, but uh, that was the situation in the last years of the Russian invasion. Roderick Braithwaite's comments tell you what it was like a couple of years later. There was no concern for women's rights or anything else uh, in the years of the Russian invasion. But now there's been 40, over 40 years, 45 years where Afghans have been suffering a constant violent attack. Maybe they can have a few moments of peace. Maybe they can resurrect something out of the wreckage of this. We should be helping them. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to move on to some audience questions now. We've got quite a few to get through, so we'll get as far as we can. Um, so the first audience question is, and I can remember this, this comment being made by Julian Assange a number of years ago, and the, the question is, was Assange correct when he said that the, the, the American goal in Afghanistan was not successful war, but endless war? Well, the phrase endless war is being very commonly used. Uh, we have to end these forever wars. Uh, that's the slogan, bipartisan slogan in the United States. Very strange slogan. You take a look at American history. When did the forever wars begin? Well, they began in 1783. That's when the forever wars began. The United States is an unusual country. It's been at war almost every year since its founding. Uh, one of the main reasons for the American Revolution was a British royal proclamation of 1763, which banned the colonists from invading uh, the Indian nations. Britain at the time didn't want, had plenty of problems on its hands. It didn't want more problems in the uh, former, in the colonies. So the settlers were banned from invading the Indian nations. They were not allowed to move past the Eastern mountain range, the Appalachian mountains. They weren't having any of this. They wanted to move west, invade the Indian nations, expel them, exterminate them, take the territory. Certainly people like George Washington, major land speculator, uh, wanted to move to the west. As soon as the British were kicked out, settlers started expanding into the west. Those were wars of aggression, violent, aggressive wars. The founders knew what they were doing. They talked about it as exterminating the nations, imposing treaties, which you then overthrow. This went on right through the 19th century. 
also picking up half of Mexico in the course of it. Then we get into the 20th century, constant interventions uh, on and on after the Second World War, don't even have to talk about it. You can hardly find a year of peace. So the US has been involved in wars, almost always aggressive wars since its founding. Those are the forever wars. Well, the forever wars that are talked about now are the ones that began in the year 2000, 2000 no, 2001, with, uh, but that's a small piece of it. And uh, I don't have to talk about the wreckage that was left in the region from the US, UK wars in the last 20 years. It's a horror story. So yes, something should be done to try to compensate for that and to turn to policies that would actually help people instead of destroy them. And we can point to plenty of places, Yemen, Gaza, West Bank, Iran, uh, lots of places where Afghanistan, where the US and Britain could for the first time take constructive actions that would help instead of destroy. Thanks, Professor. I want to move on to um, I like it's a question that concerns me, me as a journalist uh, and you as a, you as a scholar of the media. Um, and someone asks, is it possible today to have a career in mainstream media while still being able to tell the hard truths about Western intervention? If you look closely, you do find truths. So I quoted an interview in The Guardian, that's mainstream media, must have been about mid-September 2001, which gave the answer to why the US is invading by a, a very respected authority, uh, the leader of the anti-Afghan Taliban resistance. If you looked further, searched, you could find an article in actually a, a very good local newspaper in the United States. It's since virtually disappeared, but the Boston Globe, which used to be a serious newspaper, they had an article by a reporter who took the trouble to go to a meeting of a thousand Afghan elders, which was held across the border in Pakistan, September uh, 2001. A thousand elders got together bitterly condemned the American invasion, fe effectively reiterated what Abdul Haq had said. So, and we can continue. If you look at the press now, mainstream New York Times, you can read now what Rumsfeld said when the Taliban surrendered, uh, said we don't negotiate surrenders. Uh, if you were looking carefully all these years, you could find things like you could find a report in uh, 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 AFP, so Agence France Press, you know, international press agency, uh, reporting uh, in September 2001, the U UN estimates that there would could very well be mass starvation in Afghanistan if the US started bombing mass starvation, you could read in the New York Times, it might have meant 7 million people. You could read it. And that's the way the mainstream media are. If you read carefully, you look closely at a variety of sources, pick things out, you can find out what's going on in the world. You stick to the headlines and the thing that's focused on, you won't understand. Thank you, Professor. Um... So um, the next question, what consequences would arise if the international community diplomatically legitimized um, the Taliban regime? Legitimized the Taliban regime? I guess they mean recognized it, yeah. Recognized. Well, we recognize governments that are so hideous that it's almost impossible to describe them. Take Saudi Arabia, for example, one of the most 
harsh, brutal governments in the world. Uh, take uh, Al Sisi's Egypt, brutal dictatorship, 60,000 political prisoners, torture, probably the worst dictatorship in Egypt's pretty ugly history. We recognize it. Uh, recognition has nothing to do with uh, I, you're a nice guy. That's not what recognition is. The Taliban happen to be governing Afghanistan. We may not like it. I don't like the governments of most, maybe all countries. I can't think of one I like, but we recognize them. Uh, there's things that the United States does that are hideous, shocking, disgraceful, but countries recognize it, okay? Taliban are there, they're in charge. If you care about the Afghan people, which is who we should be caring about, then we have to recognize their go government and deal with it. It's the only way of helping the people of Afghanistan. If you can think of another way, I'd be happy to hear it. I can't think of one, Professor. I'm, I'm racking my brain. <laughs> Maybe we'll uh, something good will come out of this meeting. Um, I'm going to, we, we spoke a little bit about um, poppy cultivation. There was a question out about that, but you kind of spoke to it before. So I'm going to move on to question five. And this is, a, this is an important one, um, I think. What are the key differences between the Taliban of the 1990s and of, and of now? How, how, how have they changed as a, a movement, an organization, um, as, a, as a political grouping? Well, I first should comment that I claim no expertise in this, so I'm just using secondary sources. Uh, the, uh, it looks as if the older elements of the Taliban have moderated their positions. Whether the younger ones have, the ones who've been fighting on the ground, not just sitting in Quetta in Pakistan, with how they're reacting, I don't know. After years, 20 years of fighting a brutal war on the ground, you don't know how people feel. These are people who have lived in the villages where wedding parties were attacked by drones, killing a couple dozen people, where men and boys were dragged out of their homes and thrown in torture chambers, how they feel I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they're brutal, if they've been brutalized and uh, are angry, and they're going to be the ones who are going to take over. So I think we're probably seeing internal conflicts within the Taliban among the more, basically the older group who seem more willing to be accommodating and moderate and younger elements who probably have been really brutalized by this experience. Furthermore, remember that the Taliban are still fighting a war against ISIS, the reconstituted ISIS, which is carrying out uh, bombings, atrocities, uh, has plainly has a base. I don't know who's supporting them. Uh, maybe Pakistan, maybe the West, but uh, they're there. And there's a major conflict between them and the Taliban at this point. So they don't have an easy time of it. The main support they're getting, as far as I can see, is from the China-based regional organizations, apart from India, which has its own game to play. Thank you, Professor. I'm conscious we, we've reached the end of our 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to Nina now. Nina now, but thank you very much. It's a, an honor and a privilege, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, uh, and a massive thank you to you, Professor Chomsky. I know that you may have to leave us soon, but of course you're welcome to, to stay if you can. Uh, we're going to continue the discussion now and maybe expand on some of the things we just heard. So for part two of this event, we're joined by two guests. The first is Nargis Nihan. She's Afghanistan's former Minister of Mines and Petroleum and a women's rights activist. We also have Dr. Althea Maria Rivas, 
who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Development Studies at SOAS. She lectures on gender and peace and conflict. Jo, I'm going to hand things back to you now, but before you talk to our panelists, I think we'd like to hear a little bit about your own experience. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Jo was part of the British forces who went to Afghanistan and later refused to fight and was sent to a military jail because of that. Um, since then, Joe, you've been on a bit of a mission to destroy what you call the military fantasy. Uh, I know you've recently written a book on this subject too, so please tell us a little bit more. I do. The, the book is uh, is called Veteranhood, uh, and it came out this week. And that's um, it's. Uh, I, I I wanted to try and puncture the myths about veterans. There are lots of assumptions about veterans that that they're all right wing, um, that they're unreachable, that they're irredeemable, and I wanted to try and. Um, Try and talk about some some of the history of that, uh, the history of radical veterans movements. That that war, the experience of war in the military, can sometimes send you spinning off in a progressive direction, as well as a, um, a kind of far right direction, um, and very various other issues um, about um, veterans today. Um, in focused on British veterans, but it touches on American veterans a little bit as well. But yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. I, I joined the ranks. I wasn't an officer. I was a soldier in the ranks, um, from a very poor working class background. That I would I would judge. Um, and went to Afghanistan. Most, I mostly joined for economic reasons, but I, I certainly, some of the ideological stuff is there. Um, the idea that uh, the British military is a force for good. Turns out I probably wouldn't make that case today. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, refused a second tour, served one tour in 2006, refused a second tour, found my way to military prison, uh, the UK's military prison in Colchester, and was discharged, went to uni, um, read a lot of Chomsky, um, <laughs> did, studied politics, um, became a journalist. And then I, my second trip to Afghanistan was last year. Um, I made a documentary looking at the, the so-called zero units, which are CIA run um, death squads um, in effect. And, and lots of innocent people have been caught up in their house raids um, and, and uh, other military actions related to them. So it's been an interesting ride. And uh, um, I started somewhere very different to where I am now politically. I think. And is there anything that, that Professor Chomsky said that particularly resonates with you? Um, yeah, I, I, I followed Professor Chomsky for years, so all of it resonates with me, um, um, to be honest. But I think he's particularly interesting. He spoke about the, the peace um, forces which, are, which want peace in Afghanistan. And during my visit there, I met a group of a very young, very enthusiastic um, Afghan people in their teens and early 20s. Um, uh, the Afghan peace volunteers and it's 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 we interviewed them and I spent a couple of days with them and they spoke about the conditions of their lives and what they wanted how they saw the future and this was before the the occupation collapsed um, so things probably looked slightly rosier then but it's it's a it's a tragedy I think that um, a, a lot of those people I've tried to stay in touch but they've been much more difficult to contact um, but but as Professor Chomsky says the, those people are there it's not necessarily the Taliban or Washington or the Taliban in London. There are other kinds of people um, who are involved in that and have their own ambitions for a better future in Afghanistan. Thanks, Joe. And just uh, you can feel free to start the conversation with uh, Naragis and Althea. Thank you. Um, thank you both for joining us. Um, and thanks for, for staying with us, Professor Chomsky. I'm going to come to you um, first, Nargis. Um, if I can. Um, and I suppose there are questions here. This topic of legitimacy keeps coming up and it's probably a good thing for what we're talking about. But 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 what does the fact that the Afghan government fell as soon as the Americans left um, tell us about the legitimacy of that government, a government of which, as I understand it, you were a part? Um, and, and did that government have widespread support among people in Afghanistan? Um, thank you very much, Joe. First of all, I have to thank uh, Nina for arranging today's uh, discussion, which I find very informative. Um, well, speaking of state legitimacy, as we all know, Afghanistan challenges and conflict uh, have, um, which eventually led to fall of the state, have three dimensions of con uh, uh, that uh, of issues that we cannot reflect them: the domestic dimension, the regional dimension, and international dimension. So, about the domestic uh, 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 dimension of Afghanistan conflict. 
Afghanistan was never in peace. Even during the last 20 years, we were constantly in war and violence was increasing on a daily basis. Corruption was something that even Professor John, uh, Chomsky and everybody talked about it, and it was very common and it was quite high in Afghanistan. Impunity and misuse of power, unfortunately, was there. The over centralization of power and decision making in Kabul, mainly in the palace, made responsive governance, rule of law, and service delivery very, uh, very difficult, especially to the people who are living in the province where they were 50% of the uh, population. Capture and monopoly of all power by, and resources by one group, mainly diaspora, uh, made it very difficult for people to feel that they were included in the government. And the kind of political order that we had in Afghanistan, which was highly centralized, and it was very much on ethnical uh, division, it was an imposed structure by the West on Afghanistan, which was, it was not a chosen structure by Afghans themselves. We had three disputed in the election in 2009, 2014, and 2018. And of course, we had finally the power vacuum, so the Taliban didn't take by victory. Basically, it was kind of handed over by them. So this was all the domestic issues that we had inside the country. And unfortunately, it was not something that happened in the last one or two years. This was something that started in the beginning, but it began get worse and worse from 2010 onward until it got to the collapse of state. With regard to um, a regional dimension of Afghanistan conflict, I think uh, Professor, uh, Professor Chomsky explained it very well that now we have the uh, China-based uh, position that the regional countries are having. And these countries before uh, collapse of Afghan state and the capture of uh, Afghanistan by the Taliban, they were basically uh, supporting their own warlords and they were uh, supporting proxy war in Afghanistan. So we had Taliban fighting the government, but we also had the warlords challenging the, uh, the government. We also had people inside the system that unfortunately were very much connected with the system. And regional countries, mostly our neighboring countries, had very destructive role that they played and constantly they kept, they came with um, different ideas and different strategies to, to, to defame the government and to basically uh, does not, do not let Afghan, Afghanistan develop on its own. And with regard to uh, international community, once again, it was spoken very well, but I'll give one very simple example. And that is the issue of women's rights, human rights, civil society and media that all the time the international community and especially the US is talking about. While they, are talk they were talking about all these important elements to be taken in account and should be included in all discussions. But whenever they were discussing important issues, uh, are making the decisions, they were working mainly with two groups of Afghans. Either they were talking with a group of diasporas that they were speaking English and it was easy for them to communicate with them, drink with them, party with them, and then make important decisions with them or make them happy. Or it was a group of politicians and warlords that uh, somehow they were thinking that if they keep them happy, they can just uh, keep the country uh, moving. But to be very honest to you, both of these groups have no intention of uh, serving or even understanding Understanding that on people. The best example that uh, we can look is the mismanagement of the peace process. It was led by the US and it was badly mismanaged. The withdrawal was impossible, it was very irresponsible. And, um, and on top of that, on the Afghan side, side we couldn't have the unity uh, um, among the political elites. Uh, and especially former President Ghani, uh, he, had, he had no desire for real peace with the Taliban and constantly he was trying to come with excuses to delay the process. And the Taliban themselves also had no desire while they were sitting in Doha, they were talking about the peace process, but literally in action, they had no intention for peace. They constantly put military pressure until we got to the point that everything collapsed. So these were the regional dimension, international dimensions, and as well as domestic dimension that all of them together eventually in the last three years led to the collapse of state. And I think putting all the blame on, you know, like Afghans or anyone on only one party uh, would not be fair because everybody based on the role and uh, that they had, they played their own uh, role in terms of failure of everything that we had in Afghanistan. Thank you very much for that answer, um, Nargis. It's very comprehensive and, and a really good overview. If I could come uh, to you, Althea, um, I know you've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan um, uh, working on projects out there. Could you tell us a little bit about those projects um, and tell us where they are now? What's, what does it look like um, you know, for those projects now that the Taliban are back in charge effectively? Yeah, thanks, um, Joe. And I also wanted to say thanks for ICOPS and SOS for um, organizing this uh, really interesting event. 
you know, a lot of work went into it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been working on Afghanistan, living and working on Afghanistan uh, in different iterations for the last 15 years. I think more recently, I'll just talk quite briefly about the, the recent projects that I've been working on. I've been looking at working with local research organizations and think tanks, mainly on looking at uh, dis forced displacement and insecurity amongst local populations. Uh, so in the last study we did, we looked at kind of, uh, displaced communities or internally displaced communities in 10 different provinces. Uh, and we looked at kind of the situation or tried to understand the situation of families in these communities, but also the journey that the families were going through and what this meant at each step of the way. Because I think people often uh, think about displacement as something that just occurs once. So you're displaced from your home and you go to you know, a specific area and then you're there and maybe you go back home. But actually, you know, because of the uh, conflict dynamics and insecurity, and food insecurity, poverty, lack of employment and livelihoods, uh, you know, what we found uh, and what is quite common is that you know, people are displaced several times, right? So it's secondary and then third displacement, right? And sometimes they, they never return, right? Um, so that study was completed earlier this year. And then uh, a few months ago, we also looked, started a different study on the peace dialogue and excluded voices, which focused on women in, in the provinces. And there we specifically were trying to kind of generate um, more voices um, or include more voices on specific issues. So like the ceasefire, for example, you know, what was going on in areas where uh, the Taliban had already Kind of set up uh, and also you know what women thought about the Taliban coming back like you know, the, the peace process itself. So this last project on the peace process obviously was halted. <laughs> um, the organization I was working with had to stop operations in August obviously. Um, we started the, the project in May and then we had to, to put it on hold indefinitely. Um, and the organization is currently kind of figuring out if they'll be able to begin their work again and in what inter iteration. Their office was um, shut down and some of the staff is still in Afghanistan, but several have left or are in different countries at the moment. So I think, you know, the movement and migration of people right now has impacted on, you know, many things and also the, the chaos of the situation. So people are, are reorganizing themselves and their families, their lives, um, you know, waiting to leave, have left, trying to figure out next steps. Uh, and really that has to take precedence over everything right now, really focusing on the population. I think Professor Chomsky and Nargay said it, you know, looking at um, really humanizing the Afghan population, not just talking about geopolitics, but looking at like the, the needs of the people. So I've obviously remained in contact with my research partners because we've been working together for over a decade. Um, but the conversation is now less about work and much more about well-being. Thank you very much, Althea. I, I hope your, um, your partners in the region are uh, okay. Um, if I come back to you, Nargis, um, this is a, it sounds like a simple question, but I'm expecting a very complex answer. Uh, and it kind of speaks to what Althea's just said. What do Afghans want? Who do Afghans want to run their country? What would what, what, what a better future look like from through their eyes? Uh, look, uh, uh, for example, I'm also one of those Afghans that I was a refugee in Pakistan. And when I came back in 2001, I was open to anyone governing the country as long as uh, they were serving the people. So Afghan people were open in the beginning to Afghan diaspora, that they came from abroad and most of them were not even speaking uh, the, one of the local languages. They were open to warlords that they had committed war crimes. They said, as long as you serve us, it's okay. We can accept you to, to, to run the country, uh, but just respect uh, the human rights of the citizens. So, and then later on, we even saw that we, people were open to Taliban to come and uh, govern the country and take part in the government, as long as Taliban also make the promise that they're not going to repeat and uh, the regressive form of the governance that they had before. So Afghan people, all of you, they, are, they are asking is a fair politics. Uh, but then later on, what we saw that the diaspora were not, uh, uh, a group were not serving Afghans, and we saw finally diaspora, what they did, that when things got hot, they just packed and leave the country, leaving a power vacuum and letting everything collapse. We saw what warlord did, that constantly they negotiated and they constantly got positions and resources and they compromised until you got to this position. The Afghan people want the representative government. Look, in 2009, people took very high risk. They went and to election. We had very good turnout of people in 2014 and as well as in 2019. But every time it was not the votes of the people that made the form the decision. It was actually end of the day, the embassies that they decided who would run the country, who would perform the government. It was not 
thoughts of the people. So people want rooted people with a national vision who do not divide people, stay in Afghanistan, understand Afghan people and the misery of Afghan people and just come with different strategy to, to serve, to, 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 to develop the country. Yes, one thing that uh, Afghan people are becoming more clear that whoever will come in power after this, they don't want, want them to focus all the power in the palace because they have seen that that has become a very a big bottleneck, the bureaucracy that we have. So they want to have some level of decentralization that will let the country and give the space for the different um, regions and provinces of Afghanistan where you have the diversity that based on their own aspirations, they can move forward the country. So people people's expectations are very simple. In a fair politics, fair people, uh, who are actually having the vision, national vision of serving the country. But, uh, but finding it has been very hard in the last 20 years. Thank you very much for that. Um, a great answer. If I come back to you, Althea, um, the, the field or one of the fields that you work in is, is post-conflict reconstruction, uh, as I understand it. Um, and there's, a, there's a question here. Um, is uh, is post-conflict reconstruction applicable to Afghanistan? Um, given that many people view, and, and I think there's probably something to be said for that, the conflict is still ongoing. Yeah, this um, issue of labelling, it's a big issue for the, the international community. And the labelling of Afghanistan is post-conflict or otherwise. It's always been kind of contentious um, amongst the aid community. Um, so the, the post-conflict banner was given in, to Afghanistan, even in the midst of increasing insecurity and ongoing conflict, right? So for example, there were a lot of times in the past 10 years, and I can think of two specifically in 2008 and 2010, where the NGO community, the INGO community and the civil society community in Afghanistan requested um, for the setting up of an official UN humanitarian mission, which would have meant the establishing of OCHA, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs to coordinate humanitarian assistance. Uh, and the requests were denied several times by, by the UN senior management, we'll say, uh, even in spite of the fact that there was significant evidence of humanitarian needs, drought, chronic food insecurity, growing displacement, increasing um, general insecurity and conflict. So, while the label of post-conflict has implications for, I guess, the type of aid that's given and the setup and organization of international organizations in the country, um, the decision about what that label will be has often been a matter of politics. Uh, you know, it's been down to the story that Global North actors are wanting to craft around what is happening in Afghanistan in terms of success or failure and who's responsible for that and a desire to kind of define conflict in very specific ways rather than speaking to the realities on the ground. But practically, you know, the line between post-conflict and conflict or between war and peace, in most instances, in most conflict affected areas in the world is really blurry. So it's often more a case of, uh, you know, war and then, you know, for lack of a better term, I guess, less war, right? Or a switch to different types of violence or, uh, you know, the movement of the conflict into different places or different areas, right? So um, I would say Afghanistan is not post-conflict. Um, right now, I would call it maybe post-occupation, right? And that shift has exacerbated already existing dire circumstances across the country that you know, international actors themselves and NATO and the US were also quite uh, very responsible for, right? And so it's created now new obstacles for the country in addition to the crisis that was already there. So it's a burgeoning and growing humanitarian crisis. And then also we now have things like the lack of access to banks and money um, for you know, people and their families, the breakdown of um, civil society in the aid sector where many people, for example, were employed. So you know, a huge increase in unemployment and um, uh, brain drain as well for you know, so many people leaving the country. But the reality now in Afghanistan is that it is post-occupation and there is a, a huge humanitarian crisis that needs Im immediate and focused attention, right? And what we need to focus on now is the needs of the people, um, what those needs are. And, you know, this has often not been the case. It, it actually hasn't been the case for the past few decades in Afghanistan. So I think addressing those needs, whether we wanna call it post-conflict, conflict, whatever it, the case may be, is has to be priority. <clears throat> and addressing those, sorry, and addressing those needs in terms of health, education, poverty, you know, displaced communities, like. Um, and then, of course, the question of governance will be an ongoing issue as well. So for me, the label is less important. Um, so conflict or not, according to international standards, doesn't really matter. Um, and I would say, you know, the reality is that the population is caught uh, in what is, you know, a seemingly never-ending cycle of violence, whether you want to call it conflict or not, it is, it is violence, 
and the gaps that this has created over decades is what we need to address and what you know Western actors also need to acknowledge. We have great responsibility for in terms of military um, political action, but also um, a lot of the mistakes that have been made um, by the aid community. Very much. Thank you very much, Althea. Um, and Sassy, if we could, if we could come back to you, um, Nargis. Um, uh, you obviously you, you had a, a ministerial brief when you were in government, and a, a very interesting one. You, you were the minister for mines of petroleum um, in the in the last government in Afghanistan. Um, and I think we, we we I think there's a tendency some people kind of roll a rock in Afghanistan very easily into one and say it's all about oil uh, and all this stuff. And it, of course, it's not true of Afghanistan, not in the same way. But Afghanistan does have resources. Um, and which are it's rich in certain resources, and, and this was your brief. Um, and the, the question that comes from that is: uh, Do the resources in Afghanistan belong to its people? I hope you'd say yes. <laughs> um, and have they benefited from the country's resources and beyond the people of Afghanistan? Who else has benefited from those resources? Well, yes, the resources do belong to Afghan people, but right now, except the challenges and headache, people are not benefiting any, anything from the uh, natural resources that, uh, uh, that they are having. And uh, that is mainly, first of all, because of the conflict and insecurity that we have in the country. Uh, secondly, because of the very complicated uh, bureaucracy and corruption uh, and politics that we have around the mining sector. Uh, I served as acting minister of mines and petroleum uh, from uh, beginning of 2017 till end of 2019. So when I went and I assessed the sector, I focused on development of the legal framework for the sector, the minerals law, mining regulation, and uh, development of the roadmap for development of the sector, and uh, uh, bringing a technical team and collaborating very closely with the USGS and several other technical organizations to make sure that we have all those building blocks that required for development of the sector. But by the time that we got to the point where we had to go for actual uh, uh, um, the development of the sector and giving concessions to the company to start the process, I suddenly realized that what we have on the paper, there is no political will for implementing that in reality. So mining law was saying one thing, but the pressure politically was to do another thing. And it was very difficult for me. Uh, so that was the time that I decided it's much better for me that I step away and I do not get engaged in the sector in terms of giving concessions because I could not resist the level of pressure that I had and the politics that was going on. It was too much difficult and it was beyond my control. So what happened is because of the politics and bureaucracy that we had, and literally we made sure that we have those kind of policies in place that will not let the sector develop itself. So what happened that the warlords were constantly um, uh, uh, benefiting from the mines of Afghanistan, the command, local commanders were benefiting from the mines of Afghanistan, and the Taliban, when they had not taken cover the provinces in Kabul, they were benefiting from the minerals of Afghanistan. And beyond it, these groups, uh, who else was benefiting? It was mainly our neighboring countries, Iran, uh, Pakistan, and also China. How illegal mining was happening uh, of different commodities inside Afghanistan, and all these raw materials were being mostly illegally exported to Iran and, and, and Pakistan, where they were processing them, and after that, they were exporting them with the brand name of their countries. So the marbles, the talc, the, uh, any, uh, the chromite, any commodity that you talk about, it, that was the situation. But the real mines, were, which are bringing real resources and employment, such as copper, gold, um, uh, uh, lithium, and others, we never get the opportunity for development of those uh, uh, those uh, uh, commodities uh, simply because there was no there was no political will for that. So that's why I I served for like less than two years, and then after that I resigned because I knew that no matter how hard I work, end of the day when it comes to decision making, I have no political backing, no political support, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Nargis. We'll come back to you now, uh, Althea. Um, there, is, there is an argument um, that uh, development agencies, developmental agencies can prevent countries from being self-sufficient in the long run. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to that. I'm going to frame it as, as a question. Is, is it possible that, um, for the country to develop and see progress? Is it possible for a country to develop and see progress without the involvement of outside agencies? Or is it a matter of negotiating the terms in which they're, they're engaged, but they have to they have to be involved. Yeah, I think I mean it, it's definitely a matter of trying to negotiate the terms, but we can't um, you know ignore the fact that there are global power relations that um, limit the negotiating ability of certain countries right, and, and populations. But also, I think you know 
we live in an interconnected world. So all countries are dependent on foreign organizations in some way or the relationships with other countries for the development on, on some level, right? So it's, Afghanistan has been aid dependent for a long time, but just as Nargis said, you know, it's not that it's without resources, right? Um, and I think that we can't deny the fact that there were gains made from the international aid that's gone to Afghanistan over the past 20 years, right? So for example, there have been gains made in infrastructure, health, education, improvements in women's rights, rights of ethnic minorities. Um, however, a lot, like a lot of mistakes have been made as well. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of waste, there's been a lot of corruption amongst, you know, international aid agencies as well, and the tendency also to listen to external voices and implement standardized aid packages and programs rather than listening to local voices and developing context specific programs. And also the, the myth of capacity building that is so um, that resonates so much within the international aid architecture, in some cases, uh, has really hindered rather than supported local development. Right? But more so, I think, you know, realistically, it's difficult to develop a country um, or to develop industries and social and political systems when you're given a template that doesn't fit with your culture or societal values or history, right? And when you're in the midst of an, a growing conflict, um, that those same, that the countries who are funding those aid agencies are also involved in exacerbating, right? And increasing humanitarian needs, forced displacement. I mean, even winter in Afghanistan sometimes is a humanitarian crisis, you know, often it is, right? So really what's needed is to create the facilitating conditions um, for countries to develop and chart their own path of development um, and to identify what processes of change and transformation, because that's what development is, it's processes of change and transformation, right? Um, you know, what that actually looks like for them. So the question facing Afghanistan now is, is humanitarian. It's also definitely about the future of their government and political and economic systems, but it is the humanitarian needs that really um, we need to kind of uh, address right away. Thank you very much. Um, uh, coming back to you, Nargis, it's uh, from, from when I was a young soldier preparing to go to Afghanistan, the most, the most ventriloquized but least heard voice in this whole thing is the voice of the Afghan woman. We're very lucky to have one with us tonight. And so I'm gonna address this, uh, this question to you. What, can, what can, can you just speak to the plight of women in Afghanistan? Um, and, and to, you know, to be completely frank, did, did things improve under the Americans? Was it better under occupation? Can you talk us about that? What you know as a former minister and activist, but also, also your experience as a woman in Afghanistan during that period? Well, uh, I mean, with regard to women's situation and plight that we have right now in the country, I'm sure that um, everybody's um, following the media that women are very badly suppressed. Um, uh, right now, they require even a four years old boy to accompany woman as a mahara if she is going out of her house. Um, woman, the segregated education is already introduced uh, in the country. Uh, women are not allowed uh, to go to work and civic activities have all stopped. Um, we are talking about uh, a huge number of women that they were uh, they were working and they were responsible as breadwinners of their family because we have many families that they have lost their male members. They were working in the national security forces. They are working as civilians. We have very high we had very high casualty more than seventy six thousand of civilian casualty we had in the last twenty years and more than seventy four thousand of uh, national uh, uh, security force casualty that we have all these men that. That uh, uh, they were killed, they have left a family behind that literally women are looking after them. So all these women that they have served as teachers, as civil servants in the NGO sector, in the private sector, in the media sector, any sector that they're working, they were responsible for feeding at least uh, five to seven uh, uh, family members. Now, suddenly, since the uh, capture of Taliban, uh, these people are at home. They don't have any source of income. They are not clear about their future. And they are facing uh, a very dark time. And I keep on giving the example of Afghan women nowadays. I say Afghan women's situation is less than those that they are in prison. At least when you're in prison, the, the, uh, as a prisoner, you're provided with three times food those who put you in prison you. But right now the Afghan women are in being in prison at their homes, but nobody takes responsibility for their food, for their shelter and for their basic needs of life that they have. So this is the situation that we have. Now, some people are thinking that all situation was the same and um, Afghan women had uh, never had the desire of development. It was an imposed um, agenda by the US. Let me 
take, take you through very few examples that could demonstrate very well Afghan, Afghan women's progress in the last 20 years that we had. Uh, because what happens that we keep on while always focusing on failures, what happened in Afghanistan, and for which interestingly uh, looks like nobody's taking, it seeming, it seems to take responsibility, but we often forget to take stock of, of achievements that we have. So the example that I gave you, Afghan society has drastically changed. We had 70% of our population uh, uh, being young, as young as below 13. Despite all deficiencies that we have, the three branches of the government was working and, uh, and providing services to the people. Afghanistan was connected with the region and the rest of the world, politically and economically. Country's GDP per capita increased from 130 that we had in year 2000 to 540 in 2020. Girls' enrollment increased literally from zero to more than 40% in schools and 5% in universities. 22% of women had jobs in the public, private, and non-governmental sectors. Women formed around 30% of civil servants, 50% of teachers, and 38% of provincial councils, and 27% of parliamentarians. More than 3,500 women own small to medium business skills that they were providing employment opportunities for thousands of people. Women served as ministers, ambassadors, advisors, and so many other positions. And then all the legislation, laws and legislation that we had adopted in the last 20 years in Afghanistan treated all Afghans as equal citizens, regardless of their gender, their language, their religion, uh, religion and their ethnicity uh, uh, that they were holding. And Afghanistan had one of the most vibrant and vocal media and civil society in the region. 20 people had uh, uh, access to mobile phones, and most of these phones were smartphones, which allowed social media to become the very interactive and engaging platform for people to express themselves themselves, uh, to talk about issues, to expose the corruptions and government officials and always hold government and, and politicians to account. So this, despite all challenges that we are talking about, the reality of the fact was that Afghanistan was progressing on a daily basis. And with the irresponsible withdrawal that the, the US and the international community had, they took us back to uh, dark ages. And, and, and they took all these achievements for us. Uh, so it's, it's very irresponsible that they keep on saying that now we have to deal with the situation. Taliban, they came uh, in, the, in power because they were promoted by US. And uh, the time that they were ready to negotiate, they said, we are not going to accept surrender from you. But the time that they became very powerful, they went and they surrendered themselves to the Taliban. And now they would like the 35 million people of Afghanistan to surrender to the Taliban. If Taliban did not surrender to you, why do you think the 35 million people will surrender to the Taliban? You can surrender, but we are not going to surrender. The women are resisting all around the country. I'm sure you're seeing the videos. Although they are being beaten, they are being shot, and some of them are being killed, still they're constantly arranging their resistance. They are coming out in demonstration. They are asking for their basic rights. But unfortunately, there is no one to listen to them because the world is in the mood of wait and watch when it comes to Afghanistan. And you're going to have these resistance expanding all over the country. You're going to have pockets of resistance that's going to uh, be arranged. Exactly the model that we had with the Taliban. They had a retreat where everybody thought that they have fought the Taliban. Right now, people, those that they have a vision and expression for Afghanistan, they're in retreat. Do not mistake the retreat of the people with their failure. Because at one some point, people are going to fight back the way the Taliban came back and they fought. If the Taliban could do it with small numbers, uh, then why uh, majority of the people that they are not happy with the governments of Taliban, they would do it. Um, so that is the situation. And um, and of course, as Afghan, I'm, although I'm very devastated with everything that's going on in my country, but one thing that keeps me going is the aspiration of my people, uh, their resilience. And I know that either today or tomorrow, there are going to be resistance and people are going to stand up for their rights. Actually, you if, I just, so if I could just follow up on what Nargis was saying, because I think that was that's really important, because one of the things that we've seen in the media in particular um, and in politicians' speeches is this um, replay of the stereotype of Afghan women as being victims. Right. And we saw that uh, and uh, just after 9-11 as well. Right. So, you know, we need to kind of. Um, invest or engage in Afghanistan to save these like poor women. And I think it's really important to recognize, you know, how resilient um, Afghan women are, right? And, and their agency and the way that things have changed in the last 20 years. Um, and to kind of displace that like victim narrative that, you know, Western media seems to still be holding on to so strongly, right? Despite, you know, um, glaring evidence like Nargis has just um, presented and really understand that this is a situation again that we have responsibility for. And these are people that have, you know, 
um, surmounted incredible kind of obstacles over the last 20 years. Um, and that's really where we are, right? As opposed to just, you know, these women being poor victims, because that is, I think, the message that overwhelmingly I see, you know, in August that came out again and again, and I thought, wow, it's, it's really like replaying history. But, you know, that narrative really has to be kind of um, shifted for, you know, what um, um, the images and uh, realities that Nargis has just talked about. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly add to that. But also, my first time in Afghanistan, uh, we weren't, we were, we were armed and uh, very distant. There was a certain distance from the Afghan population. Second time I went, I actually met Afghan women who were hilarious uh, and full of life, and uh, took the mick out of me constantly uh, when we were them and were brilliant. And, and so, definitely, that that was one of the mythologies of the Afghan woman that fell away during my during my second uh, week or so, making a documentary and actually interacting with people. But they're very tough, robust, uh, and fascinating. A group of people that we met out there. Um, I'm going to go to some of the the audience questions which we didn't get to with Professor Chomsky, and maybe because we're going to go till um, about 20 past. And I wonder if I can come to you, Althea. Um, which core lessons, and there are probably a few. Which core lessons do Western nations need to learn through self reflection about Afghanistan 20 years on from the um, from the initial invasion? Um. Well, we don't have too long left, so I'm going to make I'm going to make my responses quick, so you can get through a couple of different questions. Yeah. But I would say um, one is that you know, it, occupation is violence, right? And violence usually leads to more violence. So I think Afghanistan is a glaring example of that—that that you actually cannot engage in a violent intervention and then expect to uh, craft a peace narrative from it, right? And the other thing is for the international aid community, you know, there. There have been tremendous gains in Afghanistan, but the aid community has made a lot of mistakes and they tend to have a real short term kind of memory or like, you know, amnesia about these things. And there are, I think the international community, the aid community in particular needs to take a step back just for a second and look at the lessons learned, right? Because there's a lot of information that has, you know, that has come out reports. There's a lot of like local reports um, and NGO reports a lot of academic literature, policy reports that have uh, highlighted, you know, a lot of these gaps and mistakes. And, you know, now they need to engage in Afghanistan in, in terms of the humanitarian crisis and, you know, other AIDS programs as well. But they also need to recognize the mistakes that they made. Otherwise, you're going to see the same thing kind of happen again. Right? Uh, and I think it's easy to, to pinpoint those things. So, there has to be a, a different way. And I think that is the, the big message, right? And we know there are pathways to, to doing things differently. So let's hopefully not make exactly the same mistakes. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And I guess if I could come back to you, this is, this is uh, maybe a very pertinent question to you. And just more broadly, but, uh, I'm not sure where Afghanistan was on the corruption list. It was, it was fairly high the last time I checked. Corruption is a, is a has, uh, you know, it's been an issue, an ongoing issue throughout the, the time I was there, both times I was there and throughout the 20 years and before that, uh, and an animating issue. Do you think um, Ashraf Ghani, Hamid Karzai should be held accountable for two decades of failure, corruption and betrayal? But also, to be fair, I'll add my own question. Uh, obviously, the, the US, the US and the UK is involved in corruption in uh, Afghanistan as well. Um, can they be these, these actors be held to account? And what would that look like? Should, 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 is that something that can be pursued even? Um, I definitely think that uh, the uh, former presidents, uh, both uh, Ghani and uh, Karzai, should be held accountable. Uh, but beside that, uh, there are also many politicians that they should be held to account in Afghanistan. Um, uh, for example, the, the Speaker of the Parliament, the parliamentarians, um, the members of the cabinet, um, uh, the, uh, and as well as the provincial council. I have been uh, uh, an ex-minister myself, and I am ready to go publicly and be uh, give accountability for each and every act and decision that I have made, for each and everything that I've done. And I would really appreciate that, so that at least people could see that who, was, who tried to serve the country and who was just in like keeping these positions into a business and money-making uh, machine for themselves. So because it's not only, especially, yeah, the only thing that I would, I would personally, although I was supported and appointed by, uh, by Dr. Ghani, but still I would hold him more responsible than anyone because by the time that he came into power, already we had the three branches of the government, the state institutions were functional. 
The warlords were a bit uh, at peace. They were defamed. They didn't have. They were enjoying. They were not enjoying the same level of support that they were enjoying by. They were enjoying by the international community and Afghan people and early governments that uh, that, that that President Karzai took responsibility. In. And he proved that he could beat the Taliban. We saw that he managed to remove uh, Atam Madinu from Mazar, and we saw that he managed to like uh, uh, take Dostum out of the country and send him to exile because of whatever he has done. So he had that power, and he had support of the people, the media, the civil society, the women, and as well as the international community. But what happened that he misused as a, this whole notion of fighting corruption as a tool for beating his political opponents and by allowing his allies to continue their corruption. So at some point, everybody realized that, okay, if you want to continue corruption, misuse of power, all you have to do is to be a politically aligned with the president. If you're politically aligned with them, whatever you do, no problem, nobody's going to hold you to account. But if you're not politically aligned with them, even if you try to do a good thing, they'll try to find something against you and try to send you to jail. So that is actually where the whole notion of corruption suddenly increased and everybody got involved in corruption. So the US had their own uh, role to play. The, the, the UK and uh, European countries had their role to play. The, uh, President Ghani had, uh, President Karzai had his role to play. The politicians had their role to play. But I would say that more than all of them, the President Ghani should be held to account because he had all the support, especially public support, the social media, everyone around him to fight the corruption, but he just didn't do it. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to hand over to Nina. Um, but thank you both. It's been fascinating to speak to you and Professor Chomsky, who I believe is gone now. Fair play to him. Uh, but thank you very much for coming on and talking to us. Thank you, Joe, and thank you very much to our panelists, Nargis Nihan and Dr. Althea Maria Rivas, and of course to Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, it's definitely been thought provoking and very insightful listening to all the speakers today. Uh, we'd also like to hear your thoughts and to know what you felt about today's event. So to our audience, please complete the questionnaire, which we'll be sending you shortly. Um, if you'd like to know more about future ICOP events, you can also follow us on Twitter at SOAS ICOP. Thank you again to everyone who joined us this evening, and we hope you'll join us again very soon.